Thank you. Good evening and a warm welcome also from my side. The program will start and I'm just here to introduce uh, our first speaker for tonight, Juliane Vogel, who was a fellow and is a literary scholar. She's professor of literature at the University of Konstanz in southern Germany. And one of the many foci of her work is the history and analysis of drama from the 18th century to our times. She has written a fascinating book on the so-called great scene, which in the 19th century was the most intense and most popular moment of many theater plays, a moment in which female actors were expected to go beyond themselves in a fury of seemingly uncontrolled emotion, exactly what we're looking for in this program. <laughs> in another book, she has drawn our attention to entrances in the sense of appearances on stage. What do theatrical or political or academic actors do after they appear on stage and before they say their first sentences? Juliane gave answers to this question in a magnificent second book. And reading it, we decided not to put this, this podium here on stage, as we wanted to spare Juliane the burden of a solemn entrance. She was a fellow here in 1819. She worked on scissors and how scissors can serve to produce literature. In 2020, she was awarded with the prestigious Leibniz Prize and is, since last year, also a member of our advisory board. Juliane, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for doing this. And thank you so much, Daniel. So you see, I'm working on drama. I'm not exactly working on autosociobiography. So I'm trying very hard to pronounce this word. <laughs> so it's a kind of tongue twister. And I hope uh, I, I will get through my, my text. So I'm trying to explain or make some general remarks on what I call an emerging genre. Last year, the French writer Annie Arnaud was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. By its decision, the Swedish committee not only honored an author, it also honored a genre. The genre of autosociobiography, which is inseparable from her name and is now regarded as one of the most significant and strongest impulses in contemporary literature. Since 1993, when she first described her writing as autosociobiographical, the coining has proved, proved stimulating in many ways. Rarely have we been able to watch the emergence of a genre as closely or as comprehensively as in the case of this young form of autobiography. Since Annie Arnaud's Les Années in 2008, Didier Eribon's Retour à Reims, published in 2009, and Edouard Louis' En finir avec Edith Belgueil from 2014, its most prominent representatives, the attention of the literary world has been focusing on a literary phenomenon that shifts the coordinates of autobiographical writing to the political. At the center of this genre is the unlikely event of a change of class. Autosociobiography labels the self-narratives of trans-class or trans-class refugees, of subjects born into and shaped by a lower class environment who have experienced social advancement. Passing through the set state's educational institutions, they cross a social boundary that is usually closed to people coming from their background and enter a privileged social and mostly academic sphere. But what at first glance may appear to be a testimony to social mobility very quickly proves to be its refutation. Instead of celebrating advancement, these works describe the mechanisms of social inequality that contribute to the consolidation of class society in the present. Even when they are successful, the subjects of autosociobiography claim to be class refu uh, refugees who have given up their old affiliations without receiving new ones in return. They are suffering from double unbelonging and ongoing exclusion by people whose tacit rules they can only guess and whose habitus they cannot uh, imitate. The generic scheme of autosociobiography is shaped by the experience that social mobility remains an illusion. 
The climber is not the pioneer of a permeable society, but an exception to the rule of social reproduction, which remains inexplicable to him or her. Eribon uses the term miracle to suggest the improbability of such an advancement. From the viewpoint of exceptional cases, these authors contradict neoliberal promises of class fluidity and frictionless circulation that claim that anybody can get anywhere. However, autosociobiography is not a homogeneous or unambiguous form. The essential feature of the genre is that it mixes sociological analysis with autobiographical narrative. As one of the precursors of the genre, Raymond Williams stated, there was no form available to the class refugee. Rather, only a confusion of forms would serve his or her purposes. By assembling subjective and objective ways of speaking, autobiography pays tribute to this unav unavailability as well as to this confusion of forms. On the one hand, Eribon remarks pointedly that the trans-class refugees spontaneously become socio uh, sociologists, which implies that it was mainly the works of the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu that provided a theoretical framework for understanding such personal experiences. Bourdieu's studies had a liberating effect on the authors mentioned, enabling them to come to terms with their own pasts and to cope with shame, which is at the emotional core of the genre. On the other hand, we notice that these trans-class refugees also become literary writers. Literature gives voice to individual experiences and teaches them how to deal with time, memory, and emotion in a different way. Vast and voracious, voracious readings, which are typical for the autosociobiographical project, have supplied them with models, quotations, and textures beyond sociological analysis, linguistic means of another kind which accompany them over time, providing orientation as well as narrative structure in the uncharted territory of trans-class in between. But what are the literary devices that have supported the evolution of the genre? There are a number of formal operations which enable the subjects to turn back to their original worlds. First and most prominent among them is the return or, ho or, or homecoming, or some kind of turning back after a long and seemingly irreversible absence. Paradoxically, these returns mark and dramatize the distance of this outer sociobiographical eye from his or her original milieu. They signal disruption much more than continuity. The title of Eribon's book, Retour à Reims, already reveals the, its primary generic impetus. The subjects return to his place of origin on the occasion of his father's death. It makes clear that we are not dealing with an ex ovo narrative, to take a term from Horace's poetics, that is, a narrative that begins at the beginning. Nor is the story about development, to use a Goethean term. Rather, it begins in medias res, in the midst of something. In the event of re-encounter with the family, spheres clash and confront the subject with what she or, or, or he have left. The way in which this is crafted may differ at times widely. While Eribon makes retour an organizing element of the plot, Ernaud is disruptive in method. In Les Années, homecoming takes the form of revisiting old photographs. In the book's opening, she uses the technique of montage, associating the gesture of turning back to the past with fragmentation. She assembles cut-ups and juxtaposes flashbacks, staging collision in a different way from the path chosen by Eribon. In both cases, however, it is the devices of disruption which provide access to torn biographies. But there is something else which, uh, that makes this return a moment of recognition, or to use an Aristotelian term, uh, of agnorisis. 
what comes into view when the homecomer re-enters the social space he or she was born into is not only an individual. What comes to meet them at the moment of re-entrance is the self as a collective being, a collective me, as Daniel Schoenflug puts it, that in this case is a product of class. Revisiting the site of origin, the subject perceives him or herself as a person who has been shaped by class and whose fate has been social right from the start. By means of returning or turning back, the concept of class acquires contours and reclaims the attention that had been denied by the ideologists of neoliberalism for a long time, as Markus Twellmann and Philipp Lammers have shown recently. It is remarkable that this conventionalization of the genre has happened extremely fast and that examples um, have accumulated within vertig with, with vertiginous speed. Autosociobiographies auto are a huge success on the global literary market. Its authors in Germany are, for instance, Daniel, Daniela Drescher, Christian Baron, or Angelika Klüssendorf. There are even indications of a growing industry. Indeed, Eribon, Ernaud, and Louis themselves industrially reproduce the genre they have shaped. One may view this development with skepticism. One may also ask with Twelman and Lammers if class in this discourse is becoming an identitarian term. However, its success testifies both to a new and inclusive culture of autobiography with clear routines and also to a culture of collective writing. Spreading rapidly, the genre also has shown an astonishing adaptability and capacity of differentiation. Transgressing national and language boundaries, it has, has been transformed and recreated in widely different spheres. The repertoire of autosociobiography was used to articulate other boundaries which are experienced just as non-transgressible as class boundaries, boundaries of gender and sexual identities, or boundaries between cultures and political systems. It sensitizes readers to experiences uh, of many kinds of border trouble and border policing. Raymond Williams' remark that the representation of double unbelonging requires a confusion of forms generates confusions of many more kinds. Confusion between fiction and faction, novel and documentary, montage and narration, essay and film. It is because of these differences and not because of its routines that autosociobiography has become a genre of world literature. If we want to stay close to its political stakes, we must look at how this genre travels and by traveling changes. Genres live by, don't live by standardization. They live by differentiation, which constantly recreates them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juliana. That was lucid, and now we know what we'll be talking about. And while the panelists already uh, enter the stage, I'm taking the opportunity to introduce the chair of the next session. Eva Goylen is professor of the History of Culture and Knowledge at Humboldt University here at Berlin. She's the director of the Berlin Center for Literary and Cultural Inquiry, and also a member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences. Her oeuvre is far too broad to be briefly summarized. She has unfolded a series of theoretical problems of literature that she encountered in the works of Adabert Stifter, of Hegel, of Agamben, among others. As an example for a fascinating work, I want to warmly recommend her most recent book on Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's concept of morphology. The book takes off from a short text that Goethe wrote about rodents, Nagetiere, in 1823, showing the deep concern that the poet and polymath felt in observing the huge variation in the rodent's denture, in its gibbis. <laughs> he perceives a swaying between form and non-form, between non-form and form that must drive every upright observer insane. Ein Schwanken von Form zu Unform, von Unform zu Form, das den redlichen Beschauer in eine Art von Wahnsinn versetzt. <laughs> Why insanity? 
because there are so many variations, so many incidences of metamorphosis that the original type becomes entirely blurred. Well, this is a most familiar problem to the biologists in the room. It is, as Eva Gollen has shown also, a magnificent starting point for a reflection on literary form. Eva was kind enough to accept our invitation to be the moder moderator of the discussion on, in, uh, of, um, in Memory of Memory with Maria Stepanova tonight, and she will introduce our writer in residence in a moment. Thank you very much. Thank you much, very much for the uh, introduction and for the opportunity um, to spend uh, the next hour or so with Maria Stepanova, and I will keep the introduction of her very short because then you get to hear more of her, and she will read today from the book I will mention in a second. She is, and you all know this because that's why you're here, an accomplished and prolific writer, poet, and essayist. She studied at the Maxim Gorky Institute in Moscow, and all of her books to date have been translated into several languages. She has received many prizes, both for her poetry volumes and for the prose book, and what kind of a book it is, we will talk about in a second, In Memory of Memory, which appeared in 2018 and from which she will read today. Most recently, in spring of this year, the Book Prize for European Understanding in the context of the Leipziger Buchmesse was awarded to her for her poetry volume, Girls Without Clothes. Her most recent marvelous volume of poetry is the Winter Poem 2021, which just appeared a few months ago in 2023. Like all of her works translated into German, these books have mostly have appeared with the Zurkamp Verlag. She has been, she's currently a fellow at the Vico, and as far as I understand, you have left, left Moscow for good. And her project here at the VKO directly leads into the text that we are discussing today. Maria is researching the diaries of Anne Lister, an English lesbian woman who lived from 1791 to 1840 and left us with these amazingly meticulous um, diaries and many thereof. And in fact, Maria's book, In Memory of Memory, I have the English translation here, um, starts with a with the reflection on diaries on the occasion of discovering the kind of dull and banal but still meticulous diaries of her aunt um, Gallia. And with that, we would already be in the middle of it, but please join me first in welcoming Maria Stepanova. Um, maybe we'll approach the book as one usually does from the outside. And perhaps before we take up some of the issues that Juliana has raised of genre, and how your book fits into this, I would like to ask you about the title, which at least in the English, in memory of memory, has at least two um, meanings. It is a memorial to memory. It is also a farewell to memory. Um, it is a success story of rediscovering a memory, but it is also um, a story of not being able to find the past that you were searching for. And when Juliana just mentioned that one of the features of autosocial biographies is to return to a place from long ago, I thought of the one passage in your book where you visit the house of a relative and you feel that it is definitely the house of your relative. And delighted with this discovery, you return and then someone tells you, no, sorry, that wasn't the house. <laughs> so, so a lot of the stories about memory are about the disappointment. Maybe starting with the title, you could comment a little on this <coughs> double or perhaps even <laughs> triple meaning. <coughs> Um, thank you so much for thank you so much for the question and uh, thank you so much for referring to this episode uh, with the house that uh, was so extremely recognizable, so welcoming, so embracing a person who was looking for some traces of her 
passed uh, or her relatives passed and uh, still not the right house. It gives you this kind of a mirroring ambiguity. You're there, you've reached your point, your goal, but it is not exactly what you were hoping to find. And uh, in this sense, I think that uh, maybe, well, the Russian title works the, uh, the best, but alas, we are not able to reproduce it because in Russian, the actual title uh, sounds like pamiti pamiti. So it is the same word, the same two words, one following another and mirroring each other. And there are t these two meanings, uh, a lament or a way of mourning the memory in memoriam and uh, also the possibility that uh, memory is not so homogeneous. There is a number of memories within the concept or within a personal memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the book is about discovering or kind of f your own memories, but also finding um, the past mm -hmm. of your um, family. And at the same time, and perhaps even more so, it is a sustained reflection on the ambivalences of memory. Now, um, one question is I have is the book is written in three parts, and only in the last part do we get a more or less chronological account um, of the history of your family through several generations. And one gets the impression that it took all this, the other two parts, and close to 400 pages in order to actually be able to produce this chronology. And um, can you say something about the composition of the book? And perhaps also, because I've wondered about this while reading, how you wrote it. There are always individual chapters. They're tightly woven. One realizes that this is one chapter because it's thematically coherent. And I wonder, are these chapters like boxes? Boxes play mm -hmm. an important role in the box where one can stuff things. Are they like lists? So how do you conceive of the composition given that the chronology comes at the end? And what was the, the writing process mm -hmm. like? Um. I think that, well, actually the writing pro process had started long before the actual writing process. And uh, there is something I'm mentioning in the book. I've started writing it when I was 10 years old. I don't know how, uh, where on earth I did, uh, well, find this necessity because obviously no one in the family were uh, you know, pushing me forward saying, hey girl, you have to write everything down, you'll, be, you'll need it afterwards. But somehow it was in the air, it was important to memorize certain things. It was important to move them forward, to carry them forward. And uh, uh, I actually failed because at the point when I started seriously uh, thinking about finally doing that, the, well, practically all my relatives were dead. And uh, so what I had was this, well, buzzing, buzzing bubble of memories that were displaced. Mm -hmm. They were not connected one to another. So a bunch of lots of old photographs and lots of old stories, but I don't know if this person is that precise person that was ran over by a horse in 1905. So what are you supposed to do with that? And I'd say that uh, in this case, well, I'm not sure that uh, well, my stuff belongs to the genre uh, of auto social something because I never meant to be writing about myself. I am using myself as a vehicle to connect the reader to those I'm really interested in, be my relatives, their stories. But uh, still, uh, when you're facing this, this row of impossibilities, you're never able to really reconnect with the past on any level, emotional, physical, sociological. We do not belong to the same hemisphere. And uh, on the other hand, you still want to, to try to reawaken it, what you're supposed to do. 
and you don't have enough of information. And in general, I would say that the situation is not an individual one, it is generic. Mm -hmm. Especially for a person who was born in Europe in the second part of the 20th century. We all have some ambiguity, ambiguities, some spots that are getting, well, tending to be mm -hmm. blurry, some things that we or our parents, grandparents, great-grandparents preferred not to remember. Yes. So they are sort of hiding the thing from you and you're trying to uncover it, mm -hmm. but maybe still retaining this feeling of love and connection that is essential for the whole project. And so I had to find a way of telling the story that cannot be linear or mm -hmm. even coherent, just of telling it. And uh, so you are, well, I'm, I'm obsessed with boxes. And, and there you are. <laughs> the next novel's title is An Unboxed. So yeah, yeah. the boxes, they move forward. Yeah, so I was thinking about it as a kind of a special installation, uh, but still it needed a bigger, well, or a more visible construction. And so in a way it is, it is a box, but also a sonnet. Interesting. So you're having this, uh, yeah. All the old structure, you've got the thesis yeah. and then antithesis, and then all the ends come together solving the question okay. or trying to. Okay, I see. So the, the chapters are like mm -hmm. the individual sonnets. That's mm -hmm. why I have such a strict mm -hmm. structure and are so coherent. Now that you have broached by, you yourself have broached the issue of the auto-socio biographies and you have already marked the difference. Um, even though you spend a lot of time telling us in the book about the failed attempts to remember and the illusions and the paradoxes about it, it is true and it's also a recurring theme that you yourself barely appear. Um, so that would be something where your text, to my mind, falsely in the German translation apostrophed as a novel, mm -hmm. Um, I don't think that quite fits. Would you have a name for what you did? Mm, actually, there is a name in the Russian original. Um, the genre is defined as a romance, okay. which is a different, so a romance. Uh, yeah, a different matter. And uh, in Russian, it has three meanings, a uh, song and lead. Um, a love story, maybe a trash love story, yeah. and also an important concept well, for me, this uh, Freudian family and roman, the invented family story that a child conceives at an early age, trying to replace the mm -hmm. actual happenings, the actual events, with something more well, provoking or more mm. inspiring. And dramatic. And dramatic. And yeah. dramatic and heroic. And, yeah. and how, what role that plays, we'll, we'll get to um, in a moment. But perhaps we should now give you the chance to read a little bit from the, from the book. Uh, thank you. And uh, um, I'll start uh, with an excerpt uh, from the beginning of a book that is dealing with a visual image that one is able to see, well, uh, the cover of the Russian edition, a small China doll, a small China person. And uh, while well, I'm trying to, to explain its significance for, for the book and uh, for the whole structure, this sonnet-like structure it is trying to represent. Blinds were drawn over the windows of the Natural History Museum, and I looked out at Vienna as if through a layer of ash. Lamarck's spiral staircase of evolution twisted backwards through the reassuringly old-fashioned twilight of the museum's rooms. All the subjects of nature's experiments were on display. Bears, both large and small, a host of spotted cats, a game park with deer, all necks and antlers, giraffes, and the rest of the beasts, some of them surprisingly like cultural artifacts, speckled 
like clay pots. Even less life remained in their shrunken stuffed birds, despite their still bright plumage. Beyond them, the dreadful serried ranks of glass jars with a collection of bony parts connected with the production of sound taken from the voice boxes of birds. Somewhere amongst the parrots and the corvidae was a small gray bird, round and fluffed up with a strange red brow and splashes, of, and splashes of red around its tail, a ginta temporalis. And I nodded to it as if we were family, as I myself am temporalis, on my way to the barnacles and the segmented worms and the fish in mutilated spirits standing on their tails. Karl Kraus wrote, immer passt alles zu allem, everything fits with everything else, or, in Marina Tsvitaeva's words, everything rhymes. Every exhibit in the long suite of rooms provided another metaphor, explained another element in my history. It preoccupied me, but didn't change anything, since I knew that the real Aleph of my story lay in my pocket already. This Aleph was a tiny China white figurine, about three centimeters tall. A very approximately molded, naked little boy with curly hair who could have passed for Cupid if it hadn't been for his long socks. I bought him from a stall in a Moscow flea market, where one or two things could still be picked up very cheaply, and in a tray of paste jewelry I found a box containing a heap of these little white boys. It seemed strange to me that not a single one was intact, each differently mutilated missing a leg or a face, and all the faces were scarred and chipped. I spent a while sorting through, looking for the most presentable, and eventually found him, nearly whole. He still had his curls and dimples, his ripped socks, and he shone with a winsome gift gleam. Even the dark stain on his back and his lack of arms didn't spoil my admiration. I asked the shop owner, just in case, if she had any figures in a better state, and she told me such an odd story I felt the need to find out more. The little figures were made in a German town from the 1880s and onwards, she said. They were sold everywhere, in groceries and hardware stores, but actually their main function was as packaging, cheap as chips. They were heaped up as loose feel around goods, so that heavy things didn't rub together or dent each other in the darkness. The little figures were, in fact, made to be chipped. Just before the war, the factory closed and warehouses filled to the roof with boxes of the tiny figures stood locked until they were bombed. A few years later, when the boxes were opened, all that remained were splinters of China. I bought my little China boy without noting the name or of the factory or the stallholder's telephone number although I already knew that I was carrying the end of my book in my pocket, the hidden answer to a riddle in a puzzle book. My China boy seemed to embody the way no story reaches us without having its heels chipped off or its face scratched away, and how lacunae and gaps are the, constants, the constant companions of, survivor, of survival, its hidden engine fueling its acceleration, how maybe only trauma makes individuals, singly and unambiguously us, from the mass product. And yet, finally, the way in which I am the little boy, the product of mass manufacturing and also of the collective catastrophe of the last century, the survivor and unwitting beneficiary here by some miracle. The China figure I chose was not the unluckiest, the headless ones remained in their box. In some contexts, or so the Vienna School of, the, of Art History proclaimed a, a hundred years ago, only the new and the unimpaired can be considered beautiful, whereas the pale, faded, or fragmentary can only be considered ugly. An object's dignity, its tortured color, comes from its state of preservation. The poorly preserved object loses its right to human interaction. And so it was 
Although I was thinking about the fragmentary and flawed state of any surviving witness, all the same, in my soul, I craved the who, the inviolate. The little China boy's wounds could not be too extreme, to put it bluntly. I wanted him pleasant to look at. Half destroyed a century ago, he nevertheless had to look new. Over the years, the little figure didn't stop giving lessons. I thought about it as I carried the little China boy in my pocket along this or that strasse, stroking his invisible back with my finger and imagining how he would look on the cover of a book about memory. His lack of arms made him look taller than he was. He looked straight ahead like a curly-haired figurehead. He wore old-fashioned knee socks and he gleamed white. And one rainy evening he fell out of my pocket and smashed on the tiled floor of the old house. The boy broke in two, three pieces. His stockinged feet slipped under the bath's deep belly. His body lay severed from his head. What had struggled to symbolize wholeness in my own and my family's story had, in one fell swoop, become an allegory. The impossibility of telling these histories, the impossibility of saving anything at all, and my inability to gather myself up from the splinters of someone else's past, or even to take it on as my own convincing, convincingly. I picked up what I could from the ground and placed the pieces on the desk like jigsaw pieces. It was beyond repair. Thank you very much, Maria. It's another story about finding, um, in this case, not a memory, but the perfect emblem for memory. And we all know it's chipped, it's not whole, it's fragmented. Trauma is what makes us. And you have found it, and you hold on to it as a symbol, and then it slips from your hand, and it's just um, pieces. Um, and the promise was, was broken. Now, um, perhaps one question about this, what this might say about the role of trauma. If we take the genre of memoir today, which is very prolific, and you actually thematize the fact that it is ubiquitous, um, perhaps as ubiquitous as the autosociobiography, um, is there something that you're telling us about um, trauma and brokenness in this story of the doll, which breaks more. And yeah, perhaps this, the trauma, which kind of pops up in the middle of the passage. Um, <clears throat> uh, well, that's a, that's a huge question. You know, one need to write a monography to, 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 to deal with that. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I think a lot of trauma as, uh, well, a shaping experience or even a necessary phase, a necessary stage in every single person's building shaman. Mm -hmm. But uh, maybe I also am a bit overestimating it, uh, following my own traumas my own life stories and our own life stories because I'd say that we are this, well, China figurines, this infantry of the doll's world. We belong to, to the world that is uh, obviously not exactly following the world as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Pre 1917, pre-1939, pre-1933, the date might be depending on the country and on a person, on personal perception. But we are living in a post-world, uh, or so it seemed before the war in Ukraine had entered the, this new phase. Now I really feel that we are moving pendulum-like between different catastrophes. And yeah. so maybe the, the, the story is not yet told. We are still living in the 20th century, mm -hmm. or maybe being dragged back mm -hmm. 
into the 20th century. So it is hard to say, uh, obviously, that, well, ob obviously trauma matters, but uh, how much? And is it yeah. a necessary part of the story? I would love to read or maybe to write a story that would be uh, utterly devoid of traumatic mm -hmm. experience, mm -hmm. just to understand what happens if and if something happens when you get to the end of it, mm -hmm. will it turn out, this non-traumatic story, this non-dramatic story, mm -hmm. will it turn out to be a drama? Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. On the other hand, the particular thing about the doll story that you mm -hmm. just read is that you, in full recognition of um, all of us being broken figurines, mm -hmm. you pick the one that is still kind of pretty to look mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. not the one that is entirely mutilated, mm -hmm. right? Um, could you say something? Yeah, I, I will. Uh, I mean, there, there's one line where you say, I don't know if it's in that context, mm -hmm. where you say, mm -hmm. even babies love symmetry mm -hmm. and health and beauty, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and you picked what was along the lines of symmetry and beauty and, and wholeness. Yeah, because that is that is a human thing to do, isn't it? Because we are yearning for mm -hmm. wholeness, maybe precisely because we are not exactly whole or wholesome, but still we are uh, looking for something to round us up, to transform us into something maybe not so human, into something more godlike. Gods are symmetrical, and uh, so. Um, I wonder, well, where does it put us? Because I think that uh, overstepping into this realm of memory or, well, personal stories, which is uh, becoming more and more of a collective process now, yeah. um, we are, um, how to put it, um, we are always, you know, stumbling again and again uh, uh, on the same impossibilities. And one of them is the uh, obvious, what you know, what all the letters capital, uh, impossibility of being fair mm. to ourselves or to this uh, drone world. Because uh, you want to memorize everything, you want not to make a difference between the interesting and uninteresting, the broken okay. and the, um, and the uh, who. But still in your heart or in your eyes of a beholder, you are making the choice. You are trying to put things together. Mm. Maybe it is somehow against human nature, mm. against its visceral side, to be, to agree with the idea of failure. Mm. Or maybe it is something that we would be able to teach ourselves, mm. but it takes time and effort. Let me pick up on this idea, what you just said, about being fair, uh -huh. right? Um, because um, one thing that you do share with your autosocial biographies is a concern for weaving together um, a collective story and an individual story. Mm -hmm. But I would say that um, one difference between, let's say, Didier Alban or uh, Annie Anou, um, is that they, are, um, they focus on the chances mm -hmm. of discovering, by focus on themselves, auto, um, a general collective history, in this case, for, of all a class history. Now, it seems to me that um, your book is focusing on the difficulties, particularly when it comes to those who are dead, and the ethical problems involved of speaking for those no longer alive, which for Germans with a intense relationship to a certain kind of Erinnerungskultur uh, is, is very different. Could you say something about mm -hmm. this question of how the individual doesn't really appear that much? The collective is very much a concern for you, family, and beyond, but there is a great considerations about what it would mean to be fair and whether one has the right to remember. And that's mm -hmm. a very interesting uh, question that occupies you a lot in the book. Mm -hmm. Could you say something about that? 
Yeah, it is a long-standing, a long-standing question for me. And uh, uh, well, first of all, and that is what makes the the Russian cultural and historical situation, which I am grounded in, uh, so so different from the German one. Well, there is a lot of things, but uh, including the fact that in Germany, after all, the Nazi period was lasting for 12 years, not for 70, yeah. which means that the social experiment was not only long going, but much more successful despite its obvious failure. So a lot of things were going on. And uh, it somehow alters, I'd say, this, um, this uh, uh, possibility uh, of uh, telling your own story or your parents' story as a story of, uh, of uh, an upward or downward movement along the class still class ledger. Because uh, one thing is if you are transcending, but it is more or less a one-way road. You're going up, you're going down. Mm -hmm. But in the Soviet times, mm, uh, well, the whole thing was uh, going again back and forth. So you could become, and uh, you remember this, these lines from, uh, from a communist song, um, the, uh, those who were no ones would become everything. But you were able to become everything, and then a non-person, and, and then everything again okay. uh, within one's, one's lifetime and within a few generations. So you never had a fitting description yeah. of who you were. And that, that is one thing. And uh, another thing is, I'd say it is kind of connected. Um, in the German history, uh, I suppose maybe it is not as you know, easy and transparent as it seems to me. But still, the, the main narrative is presenting you this three types of citizens, the, mm, the victims, the, the killers, and the bystanders. And so everything is more or less clearly defined. And you know which group you are belonging to, or which group did your uh, great-grandparents mm -hmm. belong to. But uh, in the Soviet history, you mm -hmm. not only you were able to be all the three things in a row, or sometimes even you know for a, for a few times exactly. again and again, mm -hmm. but uh, it was high, highly likely to happen to you, and the more so, the more visible you were. Mm -hmm. So if you were this someone, if you were traversing the class ladder, you were sentenced to go mm -hmm. through all these mm -hmm. stages. And uh, it sort of changes your perception of what class is, or what history yeah. is, and what is, and I'd say that's the most important thing, what is basically the notion of a personal choice, of a person's choice. Yeah. Uh, does it really define anything? Does it really matter? You are choosing, mm. and then you're you know, getting, getting broken on the um, floor of a bathroom and all you left is splinters. Mm. So, mm. yeah, so there is there, the, this one movement um, leaving one class and going into another mm -hmm. is more dynamic that happens in various directions. Mm -hmm. And yep. that has then consequences for the questions of mm -hmm. identity, right? And the, the question of identity we have to get to. But I wanted to ask you one other thing about um, the um, position of she who recalls the memories and constructs the memories of others, right? In, at one point, you say in the book, um, uh, you say, all those on the shadowy side of history are her, the narrators, the subject of the memory, your hostages. Pretending her obsession is a duty to her family. So there is a way in which you criticize yourself and in which there is a question for you about what, what are the rights of memory mm -hmm. and what demands do those have whom you remember 
right? And that question about this highly ethically volatile relationship of the person who remembers to the persons who are remembered, especially when they're dead. Can you say something about yeah. that? Because that seems to me one striking difference to the um, autosociobiographies. Clearly, these texts are also, um, it's not a self-same subject and an identical I, but the kind of, um, there's not an ethical issue about remembering, but mm -hmm. for you, there is. That partially has to do with the history, but maybe there is something else mm -hmm. going on. Uh, yeah, that, 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 that's really interesting because uh, that we, um, there is a number of things that um, I did realize from the very beginning, maybe. And uh, one of them was um, the fact that um, I would never be able to ask for a permission from my dead relatives when it uh, well when it um, well comes to to writing the book about them and even more so to reproducing <coughs> their own writings and that was the starting point and uh, actually the driving force behind the book. Uh, my relatives. Uh, they had different uh, stories, some of them quite uh, fascinating, some of them maybe not so, uh, but it, what not, it was not that important for me. Uh, but I always knew that <clears throat> what I want to do in this book is not to fictionalize their lives, but to give them voice. It is a turn of phrase that gets much repeated nowadays but uh, I was meaning something else. Yeah. Not trying to sing in their voices whatever song I would like to sing, but to be able to quote at length their actual stories, their actual letters, their notebooks, their diaries, and, well, to get away with that, because writers have readers, and the readers are supposed to be yeah. interested, and uh, this touch a matter of being interesting, not so interesting, enters the scene. So the whole book, in a way, is an installation or a forest that was designed and grown up to surround these scraps of papers and to make you read them. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so, sorry for that, <laughs> if I have readers here. But, but let me try again, that's true. And there, okay. are, there's a certain, certainly the audience, but there's also a moment where you say of yourself that even the tiniest, driest thing that mm -hmm. you find, mm -hmm. the tiniest splinter, that you are able to infuse it so it becomes, uh, let me get this right, a pop-up cherry orchard, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the tiny little thing goes into something big. But there's also a kind of critique of yeah, this yeah, procedure. Yeah, yeah. And I'd like to hear some more about that, okay, if I may. We're, we're coming to that. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the thing is, yeah, mm, I, I, I do sincerely uh, and painfully regard this genre uh, being a bit faulty because it is mainly dealing with those who are unable to say no. Yeah. And uh, I actually think that what we need is a sort of a declaration of the rights of the dead. Yeah. That would be defending them from us, the live ones, yeah. and would defend us, the dead ones, when we'll get there. Yeah. And uh, it is not something that is going on nowadays. They could be formed and reformed and transformed. They could be yeah. understood and misunderstood, whatever way we like it. And uh, for me, it is something deeply disconcerting. But at the same time, and I admit that it is totally, yeah. well, it doesn't follow, it doesn't, uh, uh, it is not, it, mm, it is not logical, but still I am writing this book about, about my family, trying to resurrect yeah. them, to make them speak again, despite the fact that actually they might prefer to be staying on the margins or mm -hmm. in the darkness. That's an interesting cultural mm -hmm. situation we're having when yeah. we are speaking of, well, the necessity of remembrance. Uh, there is another catchphrase, yeah. uh, to put something 
into light, mm. as if yeah. as if the light was by definition, you know, a good thing. And what comes to mind, uh, to mind is Juni Tiratanidaki with his praise of shadow. Well, actually, a person has a right to stay invisible, to stay in the shadows, not to be written about, not to you know, not to enter the stage, and uh, still. We have, well, I have this yearning to, to save at least something, to make them, you know, move and speak. Mm. And so I need to do it in some dignified way. Yeah, right. But how to do it? Because in a way, it is this biblical uncovering of your ancestors' yeah. nudity, nakedness. Yeah. And still I am doing, being perfectly conscious of what yeah. I am doing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, well, the short way of answering it, it, it is a question for me as well. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, it, it, it is a question, but it's also clear that mm -hmm. um, some of your sense of a right of the dead and the idea that when we give voice Mm -hmm. to the dead, we also, by the same, in the same maneuver, silence them, or we do not, mm -hmm. at least cannot ask them whether they want to yeah. have a voice, right? Exactly. Um, so it's the entire issue of representation is at stake. But the background of this clearly, because you reference that as well, is the fact that we now live in an age where we have technology that ensures that nobody and nothing ever gets forgotten, and that some people um, stand up for a right um, to forget right so that mm -hmm. background plays mm -hmm. into it but maybe you should read this the mm -hmm. next segment because it fits in there and then maybe we'll take it up again yes perfect and yeah let's come back to, to this yeah. story of um, <coughs> yeah I have this idea of forgetting yeah. and um, and uh, well piling up the data as a new mode of, of forgetting actually because who is going to read right to to go through all the photographs well, up in the clouds. That's yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean they are there, but who's going to look yeah. at them? So mm -hmm. They're not. In, there's too much to be remembered. There's too much material. It's kind of the opposite of what mm -hmm. you had. You had few scraps, few things, and had to invest a lot mm -hmm. of memory capacity. And this media situation right now is the other way around, mm -hmm. right? Where we do not have the pe enough people to remember the gazillion photographs, mm -hmm. not even the ones that we have on our iPhones or the cloud. Exactly. I'm not telling you how many I do have. Uh, thousands, uh, mm, not only how many thousands, uh, but um, it is strikingly different, and uh, I think we, we we still have to face it really because it is strikingly different from the situation of the new time, even the yeah. well, even the well of persons. They had a number of cherished items, maybe yeah. a collection or something, but they were highly valued because they were rare. And now we're uh, overstuffed with beauty, with memory, with images. We are supposed to recall, to remember, to save for the posterity every single lunch we've had uh, with, a, with a nice little plate, you yeah. know, designed with, with laurels or something. Um, and uh, it is a game changer, I think, in, in a number of ways. We really have to, to, to teach ourselves forgetting, or at least editing, which is... And, and uh, mm -hmm. would you say it's the same kind of forgetting that is a right of the dead, but mm -hmm. a different context, or is it a different kind of um, forgetting? Mm -hmm. The over influx mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. what used to, one used to have a few albums, a few photographs, mm -hmm. and now there are billions, zillions. Yeah. And sometimes they're even photographs of people who don't even exist, mm -hmm. right? Who are not dead, but who don't exist, like mm -hmm. on that famous internet mm -hmm. yeah, site. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is this a similar situation or different? Is this the similar ethical concern for the right to forget? Mm, I think that uh, I think that uh, uh, the first uh, the first situation is different because uh, we cannot assume that, well, every dead person wants to be forgotten. We cannot assume, cannot assume the opposite has, either. Yeah, exactly. And we cannot even assume that she's, you know, she had a position mm. on the matter. So it is always a certain, again, a certain impossibility or a certain ambiguity. But in general, we might think that there is a certain 
I would not, I would not, well, dream of introducing a ban on all the kinds of writing that would mm. be somehow connected with memory, with the dead. I don't mean we should not remember them. I just think that as it happens with every minority, and mm. in this way, but we'll talk about that later yeah, because we'll, it's in this yeah. fragment, uh, the rights of the dead should be defined, first defined, then defended. So we need a clear, transparent set of rules that would be helping us you know, not to overstep as we do when we're approaching a breathing person. We are not, you know, coming too close to breathing while in another person's mm -hmm. face. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. are, you know, doing little, well, gestures of politeness. And I, I'd say that for a beginning that would be enough. And it is not such a mm -hmm. mm, complicated thing to do, just to follow a certain, well, ethical, you know, to dance this small ethical yeah, dance. Yeah. That's what you called dignified earlier, being fair. How one draws the line between the right to representation and the right to refuse is hard in every instance. But let's hear about someone who refused mm -hmm. <laughs> and objected to your work um, on memory, at least as far as that person was concerned. Sometimes touch alone is enough, <clears throat> is enough to establish kinship. I'm thinking now of the famous 1950s experiment with baby monkeys. The babies were taken away from their hairy birth mothers and uh, put in an enclosure with surrogate mothers, one made from wire and another from soft plush. All the babies, without exception, tried to squirm into the arms of the soft mommy to hold on and press themselves against her and hug her. As the experiment progressed, the soft mommy began to cause them pain. Under the soft fur, she was covered in spikes. But this didn't stop the baby monkeys. They made little cries of pain, but they didn't release their hold. Perhaps she even became dearer to them because of the efforts they had to make to stay close to her. Month after month, I transcribed my family's letters and documents pouring over the microscopes and microscopic handwriting, the rapid accounts of long dead conversations. I began to understand them better and love them more. I wonder whether imitation often ended in this way. One young poet who was exiled to Voronezh together with Osip Mandelstam began to think that he himself was the author of Mandelstam's poems. And I too, carefully coping out the comas and the little mistakes of my ancestors, was no longer able to see the line that divided their lives from mine. So I typed up my father's thrilling and surprising letters sent from Baikonur in 1965, where secret space installations were being constructed. There was a military presence on the step, and my father and his friend Kolya were civilian instructors. I remember from my childhood, the accounts of how my father had caught a wily little vixen, a Karsak, on the Kazakh steppe and was attempting to train it. But the proud little beast wouldn't eat or drink and wanted, wanted its freedom, so after three days they let it go. I found his letters among the paper at Aunt Gala's, and there were, there were lots of them. The people and circumstances of these letters became firmly fixed in my head as I typed them up, page by page. It was as if they had always been there, a natural progression of my own internal landscape. My 26-year-old father hitching a ride to spend an evening drinking with a group of geologists from Moscow, or stuffing a marmot, or trying to send a rifle home wrapped in a fur jacket, behaving like a hero in a Soviet-era cheerful young man building socialism film. They didn't much surprise me that letters were written 50 years ago. At some point in the process, without giving it much thought, I sent the file with the letters to my father and asked him whether I could quote from the letters in my book. I didn't doubt for a moment that he would give me permission. They were wonderfully well-written texts 
lively, funny, and very distant from our world now. Yet there was something else. In my head, the letters I had typed up had become my own. I had become used to considering them part of a collective history of which I was the author. Papers found in a pile of no use to anyone else, so do what you want with them, throw them away or keep them. Their fate depended on me, their publisher. Quoting from them meant saving them, leaving them in their box meant consigning them to a long darkness. Who else, if not me, should decide how to deal with them? Without being aware of it, I had internalized the logic of ownership, not in the sense of a tyrant lording it over his hundreds of enslaved peasants, but perhaps like the tyrant's enlightened neighbor with a landscaped park and a theater in which his serfs acted and sang. The subject of my love and my grief had become my property to treat as I wished. My other heroes couldn't object or react for obvious reasons. They were dead. The dead have no rights. Their property and the circumstances of their fate can be used by anyone and in any way. In the first few months and years after death, humanity attempts to restrain its enterprising spirit and behave with decency. Its interest in not yet cold corpse is kept in check if only out of respect for the living, the family and friends. Then the years pass and the rules of decency, the rules of the collective, the laws of copyright all give way like a dam breaching out under the weight of water. And it seems have to happen more rapidly now than in the past. The fate of the dead is the latest gold rush. The history of people we don't really know much about has become a major subject of novels and films, of sentimental speculation and sensational exposure. No one will defend them, no one asks us. A homeless person would have the right to be angry if her photo were used on the cover of a family calendar. A man condemned to death for murder is still able to prevent the publication of his letters or diary. There is only one category denied this right. Every one of us owns his or her history but only to a point, only while we own our body, our underwear, our glasses case. At the beginning of the new century, the invisible and indescribable majority of the dead became the new minority, endlessly vulnerable, humiliated, their rights abused. I believe this must change, and change within our lifetimes, just as it has changed over the last hundred years for other groups of the abused and humiliated. What unites all the minorities puts them in the same boat or on the same many decked liner. Is other people's sense that their subjectivity is somehow in incomplete? Women who need to be looked after. Children who don't know what's the best for them. Black people who are like children. The working classes who don't know what's in their own interests. And the dead for whom nothing matters anymore. Even if you aren't in any of the former categories, you are certain to be in the last. My father didn't answer for a day or two. Then he Skyped me and said he wanted to talk. He wouldn't give me permission to reproduce his letters in the book. He really didn't want them published. Even the one about the vixen, even that one. He hoped I would understand. He was absolutely against the idea because he added very clearly Nothing happened quite in this way. I was horrified and offended. My not a chapters with their family letters were working out nicely, a chronicle, an arpeggio, a letter running up the book from the beginning of the century to 1965, and my father's tales of jaunty builders and soldiers', soldiers boots felt like a necessary rung. How could I make do without it? I argued, I questioned. I gesticulated. When we'd both calmed down a little, my father said, I can't bear to think that someone would read those letters and think that's what I am. I could have carried on trying to persuade him. 
I still had things to say. It is not about what you are, I thought petulantly. It is not about you at all. It is not you writing to your parents and sister. It is the time itself writing. It's a thousand Siberian radio programs and a hundred novels about Siberian construction projects and the vanquishing of the virgin earth and about decent people and conscious, uh, conscientious, my apologies, workers. Uh, it is not a book. It is not a book about what you were. It is about what we see when we look back. I said none of this aloud, luckily. We were already saying goodbye, and my sense of self-righteousness was growing, and it grew until I realized exactly what I was really thinking. I was very close to saying, I don't care what you were, but happily I didn't get this far. Blessed are those who destroy all the letters and diaries they don't want the others to see. The written text creates a false impression of its own immortality. A silly do is set in stone, an irritable exclamation puts down a claim to be the last word. This was the subtext to our conversation. Put it, to put it crassly, I was prepared to betray my own living father for the dead text because I believed in it more. It then felt to me as if the letter itself had spoken and said, don't touch me. <laughs> I am afraid to think what my great-grandmother Sarah might have said if I'd asked her whether I could publish her correspondence. But no one asked the dead. <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> minority rights for the dead. Mm -hmm. That's, um, at least from a legal standpoint, difficult. And that would be probably not a minority, but a majority in a certain <laughs> sense. Um, along those lines, let me, let me try out a question against this background. Um, the, at the moment in the text, you say how you go to the historian uh, at, the, at a museum mm -hmm, uh, in Washington, in Washington museum, yeah. and mm -hmm. um, you tell him what you're doing. He says, oh, you're another one of those who are writing their family, traveling mm -hmm. all over the world, writing their family's mm -hmm. um, history. And we know that not only autosocial biography, but also the family memoir is a huge segment in the book market. And you sometimes also voice some worry that this has become, how do you say, um, some of the equivalent of the grand tour in the 18th century mm -hmm. to go and restructure your family, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's some criticism, but one could make the argument, and this now gets to the point you just talked about, one could make the argument that in both the memoir and the autosocial biography, um, the category of authenticity mm -hmm. becomes very important. And the reason it becomes important is because it has become so difficult in recent decades, um, in certain contexts, um, to speak for someone else and on behalf of someone else. So everything that is termed under cancel culture, political correctness, <laughs> identity politics has to do with um, questioning whether we have the right to speak for someone else, right? Would you say that your, um, your sense of, qu one could say what you're doing is radicalizing this question of appropriation mm -hmm. of others by extending it to the dead. But then the category of authenticity is not something that is really important mm -hmm. for you. See the chipped little China boy. Mm -hmm. Um, or would it? It, uh, it is important, uh, but in a, maybe in a, in a special sense. Uh, what I am interested in, and uh, well, I have certain uh, problems uh, with the genre of uh, auto, auto fiction as it is developing now, mm, not as a reader, but as a writer maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, I am totally endorsing and praising and admiring this emerging genre of memorial writing, mm -hmm. which is 
something somehow. I know that it is, it is structured maybe along the same lines, mm -hmm. but for me it represents something interesting, something totally new, and uh, how to formulate it. Maybe there is two important features. The first one is that the actual quality of writing becomes mm -hmm. not so important. So quality is sort of, you know, okay. leaving the breathing space for authenticity. It is a first person account. It is a person who is telling her own story in the words she's chosen for herself. Banal or not so banal, but it doesn't really matter because it is this unique story. Mm -hmm. And there comes the other point. And mm -hmm. I, I just was rereading a wonderful article, again by Osip Mandelstam, um, written in 1922, and uh, and kicking as if it was written yesterday. And the title is An End of a Novel. And uh, he is discussing the bourgeois genre of a mm -hmm. novel and the way it was developing. And uh, he is also stressing this crucial matter of a person making a choice mm -hmm. of becoming this and that. Mm -hmm. And he says that nowadays in the era of, well, revolutions and catastrophes and men's, well, mass graves, mm -hmm. uh, a personal cho choice mm -hmm. doesn't matter so much. So you cannot take yeah. just one story exemplifying a common fate, wooden yeah. rocks, because nothing depends on yeah. you. And uh, taking it further, yeah. I'd say that all the stories are alike. But what matters is the tiny differences. This precise mm -hmm. sock on this China limbing leg. Uh, this, the way of putting it, the way of phrasing it, the photos. So I am ready and willing mm -hmm. to be dealing with dozens of family stories because I am interested not in the plot, mm -hmm. but in the reality and realness of what had happened in this precise yeah. person with her, well, yeah. her curls or yeah, yeah. sleepers. Yeah. Yeah, I see, I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that's a good argument um, to kind of link it back to the traditional novel and its psychology, psychology. Now, we have talked about how difficult it is to speak for the dead. But then, in your book, there are also very positive encounters in which the dead, as it were, speak um, mm -hmm. to you, that usually happens with photographs. Mm -hmm. um, and there is one occasion where you remember, um, where you're looking with your mother at photographs and seeing your mother as a child. Um, and you are just a little bit older than that child at the time. And you say what you feel is the sting of pity and equality. And on another occasion, not a photograph, but encountering your great-grandfather's surname on some mm -hmm. anonymous document, you say, I feel the prick of sudden proximity as if a pointed instrument had pieced a hole in the text of the document. And I am interested, I mean, we're getting to the sting that has something mm -hmm. to do with Bath's book, yeah, exactly. but <laughs> that's where we're going. But mm -hmm. I first wanted to know about this idea the feeling the sting of pity and equality. Mm -hmm. What kind why of equality a... or why pity? Both and mm -hmm. apparently both together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm. the, and equality mm -hmm. means there is something in the photograph that mm -hmm. puts you on the same footing mm -hmm. um, and makes possible, let's say, an ethical passage from the past to the present mm -hmm. and from the present to the past. Mm -hmm. Something happens emotionally in this mm -hmm. moment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I just was struck by the formulation. The sting of pity and equality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wrote that is it, something so. I did. I did. I felt it. Yes. Uh, I, I still do. I know exactly what you mean, by the way. I still, I still do. I'd say that, uh, well, hmm. it is also, I didn't plan it this way. It was uh, not something that I tried to, well, put into the structure. But uh, this book also, well, I was living with it for. 30 years, uh, in a way. So it, despite my efforts, 
to never write about myself, it also became this yeah, Bildungsroman, mm -hmm. a story of a person who is going, well, making a long way to arrive somewhere. And uh, uh, happy or unhappy she arrives. And, um, well, um, a Bildungsroman, this family and Roman uh, of Freud, they are basically telling the same story. You are having a certain mm, static situation in the beginning when the child was a child, mm. when the trees were, mm. uh, and when the grown ups were the towering presence in your life, godlike, mm. inviolable, uh, almighty. And uh, this process, yeah, that's a very well banal thing to say, but uh, that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. The process of growing up uh, means that you are coming back again and again until your actual height is getting the same that the height of your parents. We are growing smaller together. We can mm -hmm. relate to each other. We can hold each other closer because we are, you know, we're the same size uh, now we are members of the same of, of the same doll. dolls <laughs> yeah doll <laughs> club <A> broken tiny <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. tiny dolls yeah now i had already said photographs i mean there are many theoreticians and philosophers and writers on memory Ossip mm -hmm. Mandelstam was mentioned Sebald of course makes also an appearance um, and um, photographs and what Roland Barthes has called the punctum um, that is to say the overlooked an overlooked usually marginal detail mm -hmm. that suddenly mm -hmm. changes everything about that particular um, photographs and um, the vexed relations between what you in a lovely way call the old lady painting uh, photographs and texts are a major concern the kind of media um, relations between them and that's why certain authors um, play a role now my it is true except for one mm -hmm. there are no fo other than in Zeba there are no photographs in your book and I think that's good because I've always had a problem with Siebald and his photographs. I don't know why, but I have. So I was kind of grateful um, that they went there. And I think you didn't need the photographs because your descriptions are so powerful that I don't really want to look at the pictures. <laughs> so could you say something about visual media and textual mm -hmm. media and how they work in your... Maybe, maybe, maybe the first thing is, yeah, uh, maybe I need to explain this. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for your kind words. And uh, yeah, the descriptions of photographs was an actual way to replace the photographs that I could place there and didn't. Yeah. And uh, it was not only an aesthetic decision, uh, maybe, well, that's also a tool that is being uh, a bit overused in yeah. contemporary prose writing. Yeah. But uh, I, I knew well enough why I'm doing that. And uh, I'm sorry, but it also has something to do with dignity. Mm. I, um, as I knew that, I am going quite far with uh, presenting my dead relative stories, their love letters, some circumstances of their everyday existence from, I don't know, some knife from the communal apartment to, to some hidden dramas and uh, sometimes even, well, some criminal stories. I was um, well, basically talking too much and it was necessary because I needed to tell a story. Yeah but I could leave them one last resort. I didn't want the stories to be catching up with the faces. I didn't want the story to have this visual dimension. That would be, you know, too much of exposing them. And uh, in a way, mm. it allowed me to think that in a way, I 
I am giving them this opportunity yeah. to to hide away in the shadows. We are telling the stories, yeah. but not showing the bodies, yeah. not bringing in the bodies. Yeah. yeah. So it's holding back, and it mm -hmm. has to do with the dignified mm -hmm. um, relation. Perhaps one, perhaps two, well, perhaps one more question before we open it up for questions from the audience. Um, it, you said earlier that the chapters are like sonnets, and the book is itself is not like a sonnet, but even though they are, it's heterogeneous, it's varied, diverse stories, mm. diverse histories, diverse temporal contexts, um, there are a number of motifs, and in fact, the China doll is one, the doll motif runs through mm. to the end and is very important, and um, one, Early on in the piece you just quoted, uh, mm -hmm. you, you began reading with, you quoted Karl Kraus, Alles passt zu allem. You quoted in another context, the mixing up of everything. Then the everything rhymes, who was that? Maria Natsvita, so, Exactly, mm -hmm. everything rhymes. Mm -hmm. And at some point, um, uh, Baudelaire's correspondence, a similar concept of a kind of echo that, that ensures that everything is related to everything. And that was very much the impression of one gets from this book, like a tightly woven uh, tapestry. Um, but very, very late, in fact, on page 349, you acknowledge, not without a certain undertone, you say, I had rhymed it all. Meaning you had actually managed to produce this coherence via the motifs. But you seem also to think that this is perhaps, there could be a problem if mm -hmm. alles passt zu allem. Could you say something about mm -hmm. this danger mm -hmm. of what my, mm -hmm. over composition, over, mm -hmm. that might mm -hmm. also have something to do with questions of dignity. Mm -hmm. Alles passt zu allem, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, it's an obsession. <laughs> yes. Uh, so maybe it, it should have some good side about that. That is uh, something I am, well, running around with for, well, throughout my life. Uh, that is- You the, are a poet, so. Uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, belonging to a tradition where you are supposed to be rhyming. I don't do that much, but I'm able to. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I'd say that in a way, um, in a way, uh, it is the most important thing though for, for all my writing. <coughs> this feeling of interconnection, this feeling of, well, correspondences. You might, you might not to Bodley yeah. or you might not to Zebel, to, to Sir Thomas Brown. I mean, uh, there is a long uh, going conversation about the way things are intertwined. Uh, but sometimes it gets too close to, well, as, uh, Every good thing, you know, yeah. um, it makes a leap and then it transforms into something scary sometimes. And uh, in a way, if everything could be rhymed with each other or linked one to another, doesn't it mean that there is no difference, mm. that there is no uh, specificity, that uh, we were not meant for each other? It was not a meaning coincidence. Mm. It was a meaningful coincidence. It was just a coincidence, a click, this clack of electricity. Just one thing that, well, nature or universe does to us. Yeah. And this connection might be mm, unimportant. And so that's again, uh, this, uh, yeah. the, this pendulum-like movement of, of uh, the necessity of choice, the impossibility of choice, a yearning to be chosen, and the understanding yeah. that fair play doesn't suppose you to be any different from the others, yeah. so there is no choice possible, and so on, and so, and so on, and so forth. I mean, the whole book is an attempt to wrestle with these impossibilities, yeah. and maybe a failure because you are unable to, to solve the puzzle. In the way, it is a sonnet actually in terms of um, general composition as well, because in the um, 
first uh, part I am sort of presenting my case. In the second part yeah, I am enumerating all the possible arguments, all the yeah. possible examples of you know mm, solving it. And then I am trying and the second the, the, the last part comes as a coda that tries to well to put the dot uh, on the final page and it maybe it doesn't exactly happen, maybe it does. I don't know. I don't know either, mm -hmm. but maybe that's part of the riddle. Well, then all I can do is thank you again very much. Thank you.